Hey, I wanted to talk to you about uh, Sam Calavita. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very fascinated by that guy. He's a different breed of human being. Coach Cal, he's, you should have him on. He's, I would love to. He's like the best. He's literally the best guy in the world. He's Coach Cal, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. This is like one of the most respected strength and conditioning establishments in the world. Yep. And it's a normal suburban home with a two-car garage. Yeah. And that is where all these people go to train with one of the best training strength and conditioning coaches. With what people see, the garage was never intended to be seen. It wasn't something that was meant to go on social media. In fact, I've been training guys in there for years and years and years before the first post got out. The garage is a different place because it doesn't have the beautiful equipment, it doesn't have the lights, it doesn't have the air conditioning, it doesn't have the omniance of hedonism in it. It basically has one goal, and that goal is to figure out how to bring the God-given potential out of your yourself and those around you. You'll notice that the garage never shows anybody training by themselves. So first part of the secret is bringing in iron. The second part of the equation is running that iron with enough friction to where it heats up and it can be forged. But a lot of trainers and athletes, facilities out there are misconstruing the garage for kicking your butt. Actually, what we do there is probably more scientifically sound than any other facility in the world. Everything has been analyzed. Everything has been threshold capacitated. Every set they do is targeted. The difference is, is because of that science, I'm able to get a quantitative view as to where their God-given potential can actually go. I used to tell this story to all my campers in the Eternal Warrior Wrestling Camp. I, we ran what was called the toughest wrestling camp in America for 17 years. These guys trained 15 and a half hours a day nonstop. We had no phones, no radios, no nothing, no televisions. We did five devotional studies a day. I brought in a staff from the Olympic Training Center, and we trained in the middle of the wilderness. Juan went to it five times. Wow. Okay? They trained when they got there with logs on their shoulders. We cut them a log, which was called basically the towel of the cross. Okay? Just like you would see in commercials of the Marine Corps or whatever. They would wrestle five to six hours a day, but then we use them as community service for training. So we would go and we'd buck hay. We would do 12, 13, 14 tons of hay in just a matter of hours for people who had chronic illnesses. We would split their wood for them. And so rather than lifting weights, we're cutting down trees, we're sawing logs. We're, they had to do a triathlon at the end of the entire thing. And at the, they had to finish, they had to do a, a one mile swim in the cold lake, about 50 degrees. I know because I swam wow. there with them every morning. That's cold. Um, then they would run 16 miles through the Rocky Mountains. Then would come back to the school, which is the home base, pick up their log and run about three miles to the top of the mountain. They had to do it in less than six hours. And when they did, they would yell that I am an eternal warrior or to tell us die. It is finished. And they would yell that. But equipping our youth today with the means to be strong and stand is missing in our society. It is a component that basically our system is trying to get us as believers to swallow hook, line, and sinker to think that we're helpless. I can't discipline my kid, even though I know I probably should. I can't basically fulfill my duty as a parent because this person over here running the state says I can't do it and then tells me what's okay for my kid. That's not the way I read scripture. Yeah. So when my kid told him, says, no, my dad's going to, my dad's going to take care of it. Um, that was the natural deterrent as a parent that hopefully they wouldn't go down the road that other kid. And but schools make it hard and uh, society at large makes it hard. And we just keep giving them say, oh, well, you know, you acted out because you're depressed. Well, why are you depressed? Well, I'm probably depressed because my parents never taught me otherwise how to... The, the key word here... It just gets deeper and deeper. Oh, and yeah. Deeper you guys ever hear of the word? You're probably old enough. Remember self-esteem? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I was a teacher for 35 years. The training lab has now allowed me to basically move on from that. I'm a consultant. But I watched this self-esteem start as an idea and then grow into an entire ideology that, oh, 
you can give a kid self-esteem. You have to give them self-esteem. And I would say, wait a minute, you, understand? you can't give anybody self-esteem. Self-esteem is the feeling that you get from working hard and doing right and knowing you did a job well done. Then you're not depressed. Then you feel you have value because you have done what God has given you with yeah. your talents to do. But you can't give somebody self-esteem. And so when I was in the classroom, that was yeah, the last thing they say, you got to give them self-esteem. I said, I will. I said, I will drive them until they work so hard that's right. and they do so well and are recognized as the best calculus students in the world. If you guys look at my background online, you'll see. I was recognized as the best calculus teacher in the entire world in 2005 by President George Bush in the Advanced Placement Board in Princeton, New Jersey. Yet my kids were in there at 6 a.m. with me. I never took a lunch. They were in there at lunchtime. I was there every day after school and I taught on Saturdays every day and they called me home when I got home to help them. But they learned the valuable lesson that luck is a funny thing. The harder you work, the more you have of it. That's right. That's right. And so every That's day good. when my kids would leave my classroom, I would They'd say- They'd be a little more luckier. <laughs> exactly right. I'd say, I would tell them, I'd say, good luck. And they'd say, luck is a funny thing. The harder you work, the more you have of it. Yeah. And that's what we have to, I think, I think that's a big thing missing in society and parenting today. Well, well, I think a lot yeah. of, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, man, I think, Brand, that, that it's even harder for the parents to slip. It's easier for the parents to slip into that, Coach Cal, that they got to a level of success, right? Maybe they made it, they, you know, they were the first person in their family that was able to make seven figures or, or, or build a big business or do something really big mm -hmm. and great. But, all those characteristics that led to that result or outcome, mm -hmm. it was produced because of the fact that they worked tirelessly, relentlessly. Like they, they didn't have nothing, so they had to go out there and have a job while they went to college. Like they had to go through those different things that built the character that led to that outcome. And then right. once they get that outcome, you know, their kind of philosophy is like, oh, I'm gonna make it easier on my kids. They're not gonna have to go through mm -hmm. what I had to go through. Mm -hmm. And what they don't realize is that that philosophy is one of the most damaging things for their kids. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. now, the kids are not gonna build that character and all those things that led to the success. And, and it's, gonna, it's gonna lead to their, their, their downfall because now Ultimately, everything's yeah. kinda handed to them. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a society that, you know, you know, when everything is just given out to you, you typically don't value anything. You develop this spirit <laughs> of entitlement, you know, something for nothing. And uh, you don't have that, that self-esteem, that self-confidence. You don't have that, I deserve more. You know, like I just know that when you do hard things, and when I think about hard things, forever now, I'm gonna think about you just you just from some of the stories that, that I've heard from you, Coach Cal. Like it's just, like that's the epitome of doing hard things. But that's why I know that anybody and everybody that I've come into contact with, and I mean this, like they just have nothing but phenomenal things to say about you. Now, the things are not like, I love Coach Cal because, man, he he uh, burped me and coddled me, you know, and, and like he made things so, he was so nice. <laughs> no, it's because of who you help them become. Who, who, how, how they know, man, there's, I know that there's more in me now because of my relationship with Coach Cal. Like, I know that I can do more, I am more, I can become more. And that's a great coach is when they look back and say, man, he pushed me to the, the brink of death and I went further. And, and because of that, man, I owe this man everything. And you know, I just, even from talking to Juan, you know, years ago and him talking about you. And, and then as um, my daughter, you know, went through what she went through, um, man, you, you've met so much to me because of the fact that you're a coach that's authentic, you care, and, and you're going to speak the truth. And you're going to help the person identify that there is more in them. And that whatever that they believed up until that point in time of who they are and what capabilities they've got, that's that's a lie. And you take the lid off. And I think that's just such a, a beautiful thing to do and something that I think anybody should, you know, really desire to be for people that are in their life as well. Are you that person, you know? Yeah. I love it. I was just going to say, we're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about, you know, looking at people's success and their highlight tapes and thinking to ourselves, like, hey, I can do that. Or And then what happens is we try to mimic you know, their success. And then we fall short, not understanding the sacrifice that it took for them to get there. And then in turn, we, you know, get down on ourselves. We start comparing, we start thinking that we're not good enough, but it's like, Hey, we're just missing this, the sacrifice that it took to get the success. And we live in a generation now that's like, man, we want the success quick without the sacrifice it takes to get there. And so we're kind of just running through this thought. And it had me thinking about, um, 
you know, the garage, the infamous mm-hmm. garage that you train all these mm-hmm. these world class athletes, these UFC yeah. fighters, these gold medal Olympians, mm-hmm. and it just it's just like this word sacrifice, commitment, dedication, hard work is just coming to mind. Talk to me, talk to us a little bit about about the garage, why it's so special, why are world class athletes kind of flock into your Belinda to your garage when when there's you know bigger facilities, better equipment. I'm assuming, but it's like, hey, why do they come there? Like, what's so special about about this place, like what are they? What are they getting in the garage? Hey, real quick, tag. Bo, Bo Nichols said it gave him PTSD. I, was, <laughs> I watched that clip and he's like, he, like Joe Rogan was like, he mentioned it and he's like, that gives me PTSD, you know. And I was like, if he gives that dude PTSD. I don't even want to like, you know, drive past it. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think with what people see, the garage was never intended to be seen. Uh, it wasn't something that was meant to go on social media. In fact, I've been training guys in there for years and years and years before the first post got out. I, I didn't even know what a post was. I had no idea. I don't do social media. And so the garage is a different place because it doesn't have the beautiful equipment. It doesn't have the lights. It doesn't have the air conditioning. It doesn't have uh, the, the omniance of uh, hedonism in it. It basically has one goal, and that goal is to figure out how to bring the God-given potential out of yourself and those around you. You'll notice that the garage never shows anybody training by themselves. It's because Proverbs 27, 17 tells us, says, iron sharpens iron, one man's countenance sharpens another. So the first part of the secret is, is bringing in iron. That's good. The second part of the equation is running that iron with enough friction to where it heats up. That's right. And it can be forged. But a lot of trainers and uh, athletes, uh, facilities out there, are misconstruing the garage for kicking your butt. Like, oh, Coach Cal kicks their butt. No, actually what we do there is probably more scientifically sound than any other facility in the world. Everything has been analyzed. Everything has been threshold capacitated. Every set they do is targeted. The difference is, is because of that science, I'm able to get a quantitative view as to where their God-given potential can actually go. You see, because of what I can measure and I can see it in front of me, I can have an athlete that says, oh man, I'm done, I gave everything I got, and a guy can say, no, you're not, go. I'll accept nothing. No, no, you're not. I'm done. I can't go to it. I can see it right here. Go. Go. You don't want to go? Get out. Get out because in here, we do one thing. We honor God to your God-given potential. In order to do that, you got to be willing to take your hand, put it down your throat, reach to the bottom of your stomach, and pull out your soul. Because you never know truth and reality until you look at your soul face to face. Then when you walk out of here, you will know that your opponent can never go to the level at which you can drive him, and now you create fear in him. And it's actually called the TL effect. I have college coaches who tell me, it says, my boys actually are afraid when they go out against a trained lab athlete because they do not know what they are capable of. And do you know why? Because they have worked hard, but they've never stepped beyond Well, you don't know if you're going beyond unless you have the numbers. You don't know unless you understand it. So I understand it. I see it. And so when they say they're done, they say, no, you're not. You're not done. Go. Go. No, we're not done. Go. And so it takes them to a place where physical ability and physical training is transcended by the mental and spiritual belief that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me without even having to say Christ. I can do all things because I have been there. I have looked at my soul and I came and I showed up again to do it. The garage has retired more athletes than social security. (laughs) Just to put it in there like Carl Weathers, he just went to be with the Lord this week, all right? And that's okay. We do not accept just anybody. I only accept the few who want to join God's army and finding out what is their God-given potential. Society 
does not want to know what an individual's God-given potential is. Because if it did, the things that society propagates on us would not exist. Rather, we're told to believe the lie that we're less, that we are inferior. We need Photoshop. We need to live up to them. No, I don't. The only person I live up to is Jesus Christ. When I live up to him, that might my God-given potential. And not all my fighters are believers. I really don't care. I really don't care. They're going to see what they're going to see. But they're going to know that what they walk out with is something that's intangible. It can't be touched and you can't put your finger on it. David Taylor said it very well in a podcast that he did. He said, Coach Cal is very soft-spoken. He doesn't yell at you. He said, but when he tells you you're going to do something, whether you believe it or not, you know that you're going to end up doing it. And that is truly believing Christ in you. And David Taylor then went on to say, it doesn't matter where my opponent takes me. He said, I will drag him to the first layer of hell. And if he follows me, I'll take him to the second or third layers. No man can go where these people have gone in the garage. No man. And it's not done day after day after day after day. I'm not there to try and prove that I'm a, a Navy SEAL instructor or that I'm a drill instructor. I, I'm not trying to, although I train the SEALs. I train recon. I train these guys. I'm there to show them that they are so much more than society says that they are through Christ Jesus in my facility. And I'm going to live that to the best of my ability in that little itty bitty tiny sweat space. The floors, the concrete floors when you walk in are stained, eroded from sweat coming down, right down the driveway there. The walls are stained, but there's not a single mirror in there because it's not about looking at you. There's an American flag up there that says God, family, and country. There's Christian music playing. I don't care if these guys want to come in and listen to that or not. And if not, occasionally I'll go to country music, and then they really fault me for that. <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is, is you know what? I'm going to set the standard in there that God has shown me. Not to say that I live up to it all the time. We all fall short. Sure. But that's the beauty of salvation. He doesn't expect to be perfect. But we're going to set the standard, and you're going to be expected to live up to it. I, won't, I don't have a single cross athlete who does not come into the garage, who does not tell me. I mean, we're going, Aaron Pico, TJ Dillashaw, Juan Archuleta, Mark Munoz, you name them all, okay? All the wrestlers, David Taylor, Kyle Snyder, Bo Nickel, Anthony Kassar, Roman Bravo Young, you, all of them. Not a one of them comes up to the corner by the garage here and doesn't get nervous when they come that big, that left turn. Do you know why they're nervous? It's because when you peel back enough layers of the onion, you get to the core. And they know that when they get in there, their layers are going to be peeled. And they're going to be faced to look at the person that they truly are. And where do they find their strength? That's what it is. It's not that I'm nervous going to go work out. It's going to be hard. I'm going to throw up. People throw up, but I don't find any glory in that. Almost everybody does. Joe Stevenson has been in there for the last four workouts, and he has just filled my planner. <laughs> just filled my planner. you got to love Joe Daddy, though, because he always comes back for more. But what he sees is a spiritual growth by pushing himself to a level at which most people feel they're not capable of. But the resulting confidence and belief in yourself that you have sparred with yourself. There is no greater opponent than yourself. But you got to be willing to go to the depths to find yourself. And most people don't even know where that lies. They are miles away from that. The garage strips that away. It takes all the frills. It takes all the fancy stuff. It takes all the flash, the pictures, the media, the, the boys trying to pick up on girls in the gym and stuff. It takes all that and it goes primal. It says it's you, yourself, and your soul that God gave you. Let's get it on. Let's find it. That's yeah, what the garage so is all about. Yeah, I just think, man, you got such an ability to see beyond just who the person is on the surface and see something in them that they might they may not even be able to see in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a gift given to you by God. Like what like when Jesus came, he he saw all these like 
the tax collectors and the fishermen. He's like, I see something beyond just your task. And like, man, there's so much more in you. Like I can take you to this another level. I can make you not just a fisher of fish, but a fisher of men. I think that's, that's a God-given ability that's given to you that you see these athletes coming in and say, hey, you're a world-class athlete, but I see something that's so much more beyond that. And I want to get you to that place, your God-given potential. And it's yeah. like, man, I don't, it, but it takes someone that's intentional, that cares more than others think. Like not a lot of people care that much. Not a lot of people are willing to invest that much time, energy, effort, patience, commitment, dedication to get some other people to where you know and where God designed them to be. I mean, I just like applaud you for like, it's it's a shepherd's mentality. It's almost like a pastor's mentality. Like, hey, I know there's more in you. God's given you more. God's blessed you with more. Let me come alongside you and let's peel that onion back till we can get to uh, the place where God's really designed you to be. And then once mm-hmm. you understand fully who you are and what you're capable of, then the sky's the limit. Mm-hmm. Then there's no place that you can't go. Then there's no no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No, no person, no place, no thing can tell you you're anything that you're not because you've you've peeled everything back. And I know who I am in Christ. I know who I am as a fighter. I know who I am as an athlete because I pushed myself beyond the limit and I had someone there to to, to call it out of yeah. me. So, man, that's just and, like— And just to elaborate on that, I know who I am as a daddy. Absolutely. I know who I am as a husband. I know who I am as an employee. I know who I am as the man of God that I'm called to be. And that only comes really through His grace. Amen. And, uh, you know, His grace is shed on us, and we receive it. But I believe that in that grace, being abundant to us comes with a platform that we don't foresee and a responsibility to use that platform. So yeah, these guys are going to find out their God-given ability in Christ, but hopefully that will transcend onto the rest of their lives and the platform. I tell every one of my fighters, I said, you're going to take your successes out there. You're going to take your trophies, your money, you can take everything, and it's not going to matter. I said, well, it's going to matter is the person that you become the platform you use to change the lives of others for the better. Mm-hmm. If you don't make a difference, then it doesn't matter what you leave behind because it means nothing. And I believe that my platform actually started um, when God shed his grace on me. I mean... Right here in Victorville, uh, right here, Victor Valley Hospital. At 27 years old, I was diagnosed with the arterial cirrhosis of an 80-year-old man. I was scheduled for open heart surgery, triple bypass on the table, right there. Um, we thought there was a mistake. Again, I told you I was very big. I was very large. I wasn't living life the way that I should. And everything has a cost. Well. Came time for my checkout. Came time for me to pay my bill. And I became quite ill. They found out that you basically have, I believe I've recruited, my carotid arteries were about 80% blocked, 75 down my arms, uh, in my arteries. And uh, they basically said, very possibly you're gonna walk in fact, doctor, right? Whoops, I'm sorry. I hit your mic there, buddy, I'm sorry. Did, did, did you okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. I didn't right. fall. Sorry. Sorry about that. I expected uh, when that was going to happen, it would come back at <laughs> you, so it was yeah. good. Uh, um, so um, when I walked out of right here, in fact, right down there, the medical office, right here, take a left, and there used to be an old medical office right there, Dr. Jakeway and Dr. Compton years ago, and uh, Dr. Raymond. Um, basically, Dr. Jakeway had told me, he said, you're going to walk out of here and very possibly die, Sam, um, because of everything I was doing. I was 27. I remember I was sitting there and we had one baby and uh, Monica was seven months pregnant and I got up and uh, I looked down the hallway and I saw her sitting there just looked so beautiful. I think she was about seven months pregnant with our second child and I just broke right there in the hallway and I said, God, I have, I have messed up so bad. I have made a mockery of what you intended my life to be, you know, and uh, I don't know if I deserve it or not, but I asked that you would give me a second chance at life. Well, subsequently, they sent me to the specialist right over here on Hospital Hill, Dr. DeMarco, who was a world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. And I said, what's going on? They said, well, Sam, we got a problem. He said, we're going to have to basically give you open-heart surgery at 27. We're going to cut you open. And he was very graphic. And we're going to break your ribs. We're going to take three veins out of your legs here. And we're going to do triple bypass on you. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you got to be kidding me. And I was like, so there was three weeks between roughly that time span and when they put me in to the, for the actual procedure. 
And in that meantime, I was, uh, I had found a, a community Christian center in Hesperia. And I was uh, actually riding a Harley Davidson for the Sons of Thunder motorcycle ministry at that time. And uh, we used to ride with a lot of the outlaw bikers down there who were some of the most genuine people I've ever seen, to be honest with you. Um, basically, they, they, they're, uh, they show a lot of honor in, what's that song that, I think it's DC Talk, says the one thing that an unbelieving generation refuses to accept is Christians that say one thing with their mouths but live their lives another. You know what I'm talking about, that song? Right to begin the song, it says that. And it's true. And the thing is, is they used to call it, they'd say, we're okay if you ride with the outlaw. If you're a Christian, if you walk Christian. But if you want to talk Christian and walk outlaw, then you're a hypocrite. And I, I saw more honor in these outlaw bikers than I had seen in anybody up to that point in my life because they were exactly who they were. Anyways... So at Community Christian Center, the one of the pastors there named uh, Gil Lucero, who uh, has now passed away, he had uh, basically uh, a vision of having a ministry there and being able to go in and pray for these guys and love them as who they were and not to try to pretend to be an outlaw biker. It's like, you know, this is who I am. And uh, so anyways, in that time, those brothers there prayed for me and I went down in the spirit. I remember I, I went down, and uh, a couple weeks later, I ended up in the procedure at Victor Valley Hospital here. And um, the first thing that they do is they put you in a diagnostic situation, and they do what's called an angiogram. And the angiogram is they cut a, they cut a basically a hole or cut your femoral artery open, and it didn't start off very good. They put me in, and the doctor's right there. He was a really neat guy. He says, can we give you a little xylitol? So they give you a little shot right there, and so you don't feel it. And then he cuts the artery, and my leg starts flopping all over the table. He goes, whoa, whoa, relax, and relax. I just got a nerve. I just got a nerve. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is not good. So they start shoving this, and you see this cable. It's in rows. And they're shoving this cable in you. It's like 12 feet long, it looked like. And it starts going up into your body. And all of a sudden, they have you on a table, and it has an x-ray machine underneath it, too. But you have to be awake during the whole procedure. So I'm awake, and all of a sudden, I get this horrible pain between my shoulder blades. And I thought I was having a heart attack on the table. And I started screaming. I'm like, ah, ah. And I'm on the table. I'm 27 years old. And he goes, whoa, whoa, relax, relax, and relax. I, I got it caught in a vein off of your aorta. He says, let me back it out. He backed it out, and he went through the angiogram. So I'm laying on the table. They wheel me out into post-op. Now here's where the rubber meets the road because they get the results. They see the blockages. They come in, and they're going. You, you're, you're done. There's no pass-go. The doctor comes in, doctor uh, from West Virginia. I can't remember his last name, but he had kind of a southern drawl. Came in through the doors of post-op. My wife, Monica, was standing there with me. And um, I basically was waiting to hear the news. And he came in, he said, Sam, how was your first diagnosis? And I said, yeah, they, they did it. And they said this and this and this. And he goes, I said, I don't know what to tell you. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've never seen this. But... I watched your arteries go from what they said was those of an 80-year-old man to those to a perfectly healthy, beautiful 27-year-old man. If they were like this, they look like they're perfect. And he said, I don't know what it is. And my wife, Monica, right behind me goes, it was Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And he says, you can call it what you want, ma'am. She goes, that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> And good. so That's they good. took me out. Three weeks later, after that, I went back to see Dr. DeMarco, and I said, they didn't do anything. And he goes, I know. Oh, yeah. And I said, I'm kind of a math guy. The initial test was significantly off. 
have you ever seen it like this? He's like, I've never seen it. And at that point in time, the grace of God that came on me, my life didn't change immediately. I was a slow project to work, but I began to realize that the Lord was giving me His grace and a platform from which to work in His time that gave me unusual insight into what it meant to take a life and use it for His purpose. And I was telling a client the other day who uh, actually, it's kind of crazy. It's a, he's a very, very successful cannabis dealer. And uh, he basically has ruined his life with his products. He's made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, I just sit there and I'm like, whoa, that's pretty amazing. And he came to us and we were actually able to help attenuate and basically help his vitality and his life start to come back. And I said, you know, why are you really here? He said, well, he said, I, I want to fix the things that I've done from the products that I've sold. He said, but there's something more out there. And I said, you have a platform, right? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, you and the experiences you've gone through and the grace that's being shed on you now is a platform to you reach a world out there that I can never touch. And that money cannot satisfy or take care of. And so this guy now asked about making training labs all over the country to have a platform where he can help heal people from the products that he has made to make his life have true purpose. And so God uses things in our lives that we have a choice to either use it for, people say, oh, use it for the kingdom. I think that's kind of cliche for me to say that. To use these experiences to make a difference in the lives of those around us. But it's a conscious choice. This dealer came in, or this guy, and he had a choice. You know, I'm not fulfilled. This is not all the money, all the cars. He drove a Lamborghini up to my place the other day. Actually, I let my daughter drive it. It was crazy. It was like, whoa. But he says, none of that, none of it. It means nothing. After you've driven enough cars and you've had enough fancy dinners and you've done enough, these things, his life's pretty empty. He actually is coming and he was, he's not even a believer. But then he asked me when he left and I said, treat the body the way God intended and watch the miracle take over. That's how we're going to help you. He goes, can you tell me about a Bible or something I could read? Because he knew inside that he has something greater to give, a platform. And you know what? Why should we be surprised? Because in Genesis, towards the later chapters in 30, 31, out there, all the terrible things that happened to Joseph. His brothers hated him. His brothers sold him into slavery. He got put in the dungeon for two years. The guys in the dungeon hated him, thought he was just the worst. God started giving these dreams and these things. But the bottom line was, is when the famine came and his people came from Egypt and they saw him and didn't recognize him, he had compassion on them because of what he had been through. He had a platform God gave him and he chose to use it, exemplified by one thing, his statement. His brothers recognized him when he told them and they said, please forgive us. Please don't slaughter us or whatever. And he said, oh, please. And he started to weep. He said, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. So we have choices. And we have go through experiences in life. And what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. So how are we going to turn it to that platform? In the garage, I want to circle back, is about giving these guys a platform to make a life out there better than it was previously. And the only way that you can do that is to go through these things. And so it all circles and ties back together to the wonderful, amazing grace of God. The amazing grace. So good. I once was lost and now I'm found. And that's the bottom line. And it's kind of crazy where it came from. We look back and I would have never chosen these steps in my life. 
because my steps would have been wrong, but when I want to follow the path that he, in retrospect, has laid out for me, my wife, and our nine kids. But on that day, God decided, he said, you know what, Sam? I'm going to give you your life back. I'm going to give you seven more kids. I'm going to let you have all these years with your wife. And hopefully you're going to wise up and use what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. How are you going to help people? So that's how I came up with the Training Lab business model, which I told you, Paul. Yeah. My Training Lab business model is very simple. We're able to help a lot of people with the therapies that we do in the T-Lab recovery. These are not allopathic methods that are condoned by pharmaceuticals or condoned by mainstream medical because they don't make money. Oxygen is free. Light is free. These things are how the body works. But my wife and I understand that God gave us a platform to help as many people as we can until our days are done here, precipitated by His grace. And so our business model is very simple. It's not business 101, and it certainly wouldn't pass a business class in college to make a business plan. Our business model is this. Those who can pay. Those who can't, we take care of them anyway. And if they can pay us back before the Lord comes, then great. If they can't, then we'll all have a real good laugh about it in heaven. And that came that. from That's God's so grace. That's so good. That's the training lab business model. That, that, that is the, the business model that I think does work. You know, and I think that's a business model that um, when you start tapping into like kingdom principles and it, it's, there's paradoxals, to, you know, it's paradoxical. A lot of the things that you, that you'll read, like, you know, you think like, I just need to go after and accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. No, it's like, if you just give, you count out, give God. If you continue to help those in need, it's always going to come back and it's going to come back, you know, shaking together, running over more than you could ever ask or imagine. And that's yep. just like, you know, doing those things that allows God to go and show up, you know what I mean, 100%. and um, and I just think that beyond coach, your wildest imagination, exactly, and um, uh, uh, and and you, you're a witness. Your life is a witness of that, and I think that, like when I think about you and in my first interaction that I had with you, and every interaction I've had since then, it's it's somebody that really knows who they are. Um, they have their values, their morals, their ethics. They know what those are. Um, there's something that's never going to shake from those. And I believe that that's one of the most attractive qualities and characteristics you can ever have. I think in today's world, it's become more artificial than ever before. To Brand's point, as far as the highlight reels, and it, it, it's a lot of people living this this fake life, this life that that's not authentic, where they don't really stand for really anything. They're just kind of being moved and swayed based off of the next person's like or approval or opinion or or what they think is going to get them ahead. And I think that. The more artificial it becomes, the more bright authenticity shines. And, and when I first met nice. you, I just, I felt that. And then I started thinking as you were talking about the garage and, and you think about these fighters, like you're, you're coaching the, the best of the best, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, uh, who's it? Is it Krzyzewski? Am I saying that right? The Olympic coach for Duke? Yeah. yeah. And he, he coached the Olympic basketball team, yep. right? Yep. Like, it's like that. You're coaching people that they've, you know, they've gotten to high levels, you know, and they're aspiring high levels. And, and those kind of people, they've got a sense of like high confidence and, and kind of some ego, right, as they go in. And I think you have to be like that person. You have to be the person that, that does what they say they're going to do, that they're authentic, they're integrous. And, and you have that. And I think that's why your ability to, to speak life and be who you are for these people that are looking to reach these high levels in, in their, their fitness. And it's not just fitness. You're helping them become awakened to, you know, faith. Like, you know, hey, this, there's got to be something about God because I know I went to the depths of hell, like you said, and I'm still here and there's more in me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I just think that um, that's something that I believe that everybody deep down, if they really unpack and they were to ask themselves, what do you really want to be known for? Like, if you die and, and somebody's reading your tombstone or your obituary, if they're reading that, you know, do you want to be known as average Bob? Like, their, their, their lives, average. he was average in his faith, his fitness, his family was average, his financial situation was average, he was average. And I think everybody would say, no, I would want to be described as somebody that knew who they were, that made a difference, that used their God gifts, 
the gifts that God gave them, gave them to make an impact, to make a difference, and, and they stood on what they stood for, and they didn't shake. I think you've gotten to that point. Now, I know everybody's, um, you know, makes mistakes, and we all fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> We're all sinners, but, but, but to me, I don't know if I've met somebody that, and I've met a lot of people, a lot of successful people in different arenas. I've never met somebody from a holistic standpoint that just seems that they've got that. It, it, what's what's something, and I know that doesn't happen overnight, that that's a way to live through life to get to that point. But for some, it says, you know, man, I, I, I aspire to be known more like that, like we're that kind of person that that's described in that way. What would they do? Like what what's some of the things that, you think are the most important things that they can do to start to build that congruency with themselves, to to start to to become that person that is of sound judgment, sound character. Like, what does that look like? You think? Because you've got it. Uh, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> kind of speechless on that because really, um, it all comes, I believe, down to God puts us in situation in our lives so that we can feel the compassion for others. And he gave us such an example when Jesus looked in the multitudes and had compassion on them. But you can only feel compassion unless you've been to the bottom of the hole yourself. And I believe that that is fostered by taking your eyes off of yourself. It's like the prayer of Jabba. Bless me, O Lord, that I might be a blessing to others. And if every day I wake up and wonder how I can bless somebody else and change their lives in a positive way, whether it be a good morning, a hello, a butt kick workout, whether it be a smile, whether it be an I love you, whether it be hard love, whatever it is, I think that's the problem with society as we circle back to that. Society has us so focused on hedonistic tendencies of looking at ourselves. I mean, how often are we up here? Oh, I don't like the way that looks because I'm, I'm going to use Photoshop for a little girl. So, what are you talking about? You're beautiful, sweetheart. You don't need to do that. You don't need to live up to that. But society today has our eyes on ourselves. Do you notice the first thing I told you? One of the first things about the crowds, I said, there are no what? Mirrors. I said, there are no mirrors because it's not about you. It's about what he can do through you, whether you want to believe it or not, because you stepped into my garage and that's how we operate. So, Paul, I think that the, the greatest road or the fastest road to being able to basically, hopefully, my prayer each day is, Lord, please make me the daddy, the husband, the teacher that you'd have me to be and let me see through your eyes. And the only way I'm going to see through his eyes is if I have the ability to say, how can I bless you? Now, I'm not, not superficial. Like, oh, hey, how can I bless you, brother? You know, what well, can I do? Oh, that, no. You just do. And you just do. And you just do. The things that God's put me through, though, he's equipped me to be able to have this compassion. When somebody comes to me in pain, in medical, in my facility, I can see it. I can feel it. And I know that it's not so much the treatment, it's his love that they need. And so I would say, what's that song say? Put your eyes on Jesus and all the troubles of this world will strangely fade away. Mm -hmm. I believe that's it. And so it's bless me, O oh Lord, that I might be a blessing to others. It's not just bless me, O oh Lord. And you are right. You cannot outgive God. I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed man. Monica and I never had much, but we had love. We have nine kids of our own. We have everything. And now God's decided to bless the training lab and the training lab platform in his time and in his way. And we're seeing things now that we've never seen in our whole life. But our business model doesn't change. But it's how he uses people. Because see, the business model that I gave you guys, I didn't just think of that. I'm not righteous enough to think of that in my own faults and sin. God used another man to tell me that. When Monica and I were young, we had, I want to say, five or six kids. 
we had one car, that old jalopy looking Suburban. That You know those old Suburbs <laughs> look like just big old whale wagons, two yeah. tons, yep. uh -huh. right? We saved up and we paid $8,000 to get this car because we didn't have enough seat belts for our kids. We needed eight seat belts. So it had seven and it had a bench seat. So you could put the bench seat out, we could double buckle two kids. It was the only car we had. I was working at Calvary Chapel for just nothing down there, which was a journey God had me on and took us on. And we could talk about that another day. But one day, our Suburban broke. We didn't have anything. She took it to a man, and I want to mention his name, Don. He owned a place called Ambassador Auto because this man is the man who showed me the business model that we use today. Monica took it in with six, I believe six kids, maybe five. But anyway, she drove it in, or she didn't drive it in. It had to be towed, I'm sorry. It had to be towed. She got a ride back home with the kids. Don called and said, Monica, I have some bad news. And she said, what's that, Don? And uh, he said, you have a blown head gasket. It's gonna cost about $4,000 to fix this car. And so I got home from Calvary Chapel, drove home, and uh, she said, Sam, $4,000. I drove a little itty bitty old Toyota Smith, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of miles on, but that was my car to get back and forth. I think it had four seatbelts. So we couldn't, we, we could have put him in the trunk. We couldn't get all the kids <laughs> in there. So basically, she, she said, Sam, it's $4,000. And I said, honey, I don't know what we're going to do. And then Don called her and said, Monica, come on down here. I want to talk to you. So we took Monica down, down there. And he said, uh, well, Monica, We've got a head gasket here. And she says, Don, can I basically ask you if you could accept payments from us? We could give you the little bit of what Sam is making right now. And at the time, at Calvary Chapel was $18,000 a year on a family that size. Living in your Belinda. Yeah, that's a alone. podcast on itself. we got to figure out yeah, how you did that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he looked at her and he said, Monica, he said, we're going to fix this car for you. And he said, we're not going to charge you anything. And if you can pay me back before the Lord comes, then great. And if you can't, we're all going to have a big laugh about it in heaven. And that's the second time you've heard me say that on a podcast. I intentionally circle back to it because God uses those before us and those with us to push us in the direction that he wants us to go. And that man faithfully did something he never realized that he did because we have raised an entire business. And right now, a world-renowned business based on that one principle that Don shed grace on us because God shed grace on him first. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. That's the business model. And I wanted to say his name, his place, his son sold his place. But that was the beginning of the training lab business model, yet I didn't even know it. 